1940 depression and we weren't made leaders the employers forced us into these positions by taking everything away from you that you had and God knows you had little Now labor in America is at the crossroads, it, uh, it is at a crisis. All because of the lack of thinking and the lack of courage of a few people. I don't know how much anybody stole in the various locals in this convention. And I'm not telling this convention how much I have stolen myself. And I don't know how much Jimmy Hoffa have stolen from anybody. But I'll be damned if I'll take the word of Senator McClellan for anything in this country. <laughs> now, Jimmy, we have a problem of some five and a half million people unemployed in this country, a lot of them are railroad workers. And another probably three million people that's working three days a week. And a whole army of young men and women coming into the workforce every year without hope for the future. Last night you passed a resolution in support of our airline division Because they are replacing, was it our navigators, Jim? Our navigators with a black box. Our men are being replaced in the big airliners with a black box. Soon our stewardesses will be replaced with another box. I don't know what color that will be. That's the problem we are having. Now, I'm not saying any word against George Meany. He never did anything against us. God knows he never did much for us either. <laughs> but George Meany, George Meany is not the issue here. TWU can live with or without him. We'll take it anywhere we want. survive as a force for good in America. That's the only issue. We 
have an airline division here that we're proud of that's growing. They have grievances against you. They claim your men are raiding them in some lines. We would like it to stop. <laughs> we have put into our airline division over $100,000 in five months. And if we didn't, half of them wouldn't be here today. But we are doing it and we're going to keep doing it until we organize every one of the thirty lines that's to be organized in the airline division. <laughs> Yesterday we knocked off Eddie Rickenbacker. We've got the stewards and stewardesses there and we're going to keep at it. All we want from you, sir, is but T.W. have been looking for since 1940. Harry Bridges and myself used to talk about it then. A council, like the Metal Trades Council within the Federation, a council of all railroad and airline workers in this country that would work together like the International Transport Workers Federation that would help one another out. Mean, that wouldn't mean that you take my job or I take yours. It would work exactly like the International Transport Workers Federation. The resolution that we have here is nothing new. We introduced this resolution to our ninth constitutional convention in 1955 when the first document of merger was hatched at Indian Creek in Miami. And we said that the House of Labor was not ready for unity then because of the three R's, racism, inter-union raiding, and racketeering. And it is no cleaner now, except there are two standards. If George likes you, you can stay in and steal. If George likes you, don't like you, you have to get out with your two million members. That's not labor unity. We claim that sufficient machinery should be established within each union to clean out corrupt elements. We have machinery in this country and bankers have been put to jail for stealing. And employers have been put to jail for stealing. Not too many. They're getting padded cells. Now we have Papa here after going through every agency in the country. He has been indicted backwards and forwards. He has been tried. The Attorney General of the United States said publicly that unless Papa went to jail, he would jump out the top wind of the Capitol. Bobby didn't jump yet. We supported the Kennedys, Jimmy. You did not. We are proud of John Kennedy as President of the United States, and we'll continue to support him. <laughs> but we were, of course, to the McCarthy hearings as a brand of American fascism. And we were, of course, to trial by television which indicted not only you, but the entire labor movement and weakened, weakened our structure. This is not the way to do it. I suppose they'll keep at it. They'll indict you again and again and again. They can't indict your 1,700,000 fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> and I say to the members of the press that today, with all of the equipment they have, uh, they must expect something they're not going to get. <laughs> Seriously, I come here today, to Vice President Harold Gibbons, Executive Vice President of our International Union, Vice President John O'Rourke, President of the Joint Council in New York with 165,000 members, and Vice President of our International Union and with the greetings of our executive board for one reason, to be able to discuss with you, your executive board members, 
some of the topics that your president has mentioned, namely unity. Yes, when you look back to the 1930s, and when you look over this audience, you don't find many who can recall those days actively in the American labor movement. You must realize that in those days, where we had depressions, where we had unemployment, where we thought we had unfair labor laws. And in the year of 1961, you have a reproduction of unemployment by machines with the greatest gross production ever in the history of the United States. You have labor laws more severe in the year of 1961 and the year of 1932. Those labor laws are brought about by the very success of organized labor in America. Because in the early 32s, it was simple matter to have the police break their heads with a club, have paid court students sign injunctions, and be able to use the criminal prosecutors to put the radicals in jail. Today, with organized labor at its peak, we find that the McClellans, the Goldwaters, the reactionaries of America, and the capitalists of America very cleverly shifted from the picket line, from the courts to the legislators. And today, Mike, I question whether or not any resolution passed here in your convention has any effect in regards to picket lines. Because a picket line today is a symbol of prospective litigation. That is weak, unsuccessful, does not affect the employer's business, are you allowed to continue to picket? But if the employer desires to break the strike, I have a few unemployed, depressed workers, then they petition the labor board, goes into court, harasses you, points out that either a TWU truck, a Teamster truck, has respected the picket line, refused to go through, and out of that comes an injunction that either limits or removes the pickets from the scene of activity. And as we recently had in the Yakima, Washington, Apple dispute, another depressing NLRB decision, where we recognized that we could not win the fight in the stronghold of the employers and the Apple owners. Rather, it must be carried into Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, and towns on the West Coast recognizing that we have a law which restricts trucks, drivers from refusing to go through picket lines. We place for the first time in the history of this international UNA picket sign, not advertising a strike, but rather a picket sign saying to the unionized drivers of Los Angeles, please cross this picket line and make your deliveries. If you do not, you will destroy our right to hand out handbills and advertise the Yakima dispute. Leaving this was in compliance with the law. The line marched up and down and silently handbills were passed out. Lo and behold, the National Labor Relations Board came down with a decision. While they recognized that the trucks were going through and deliveries were not stopped, because the public responded to the handbills and refused to buy the apples. By some far stretch of imagination, they claimed that it had stopped the normal flow of trucks from Yakima into Los Angeles and restricted the picket line. How wild of an imagination can you have to destroy a union? How wild of an imagination can you have to be vindictive and then, though later than yesterday, a silly decision came down. 
out of the National Labor Relations Board with a divine organized labor and skillfully read between the lines and find a decision. Where they say that a union can picket an organized establishment under contract if they believe that the wages and conditions are substandard to books. Now contrast the two. Here is a strike of workers fighting for a contract and conditions. And they are restrained from passing out handbills. And here the decision creates a fight, allowing pickets between two unions to picket each other under the same law that restricted the right of free speech and passing out handbills. All of this in the year of 1961 for one sole purpose only, to divide, to create fights, create disharmony, and to be able to destroy the American labor movement. And if you look back in this great city of New York in 1955, when we met here, so-called unity of labor was brought about you will recognize that the speeches made in that convention all were for naught. Talking about organizing the South, organizing the unorganized workers in America, and really what's happened. Today you have less union men than all of the unions of America than you had in 1955. Because we have given up the fight. I say we, I say the American labor movement, not the Teamsters, not your international union. No. But if you travel out of the metropolitan areas, the cities of the United States, you will not find one single organized campaign to organize unorganized workers anywhere in the South, except the Teamsters Union. You will not find one single successful strike being called in the South where they have control of the sheriffs, control of the police, control of the courts, control, if you please, of the entire community life, and the signal for coordinated action of all that's bad is to have an organizer appear in the town, hand out handbills at an ununion plant, call meetings of the workers, and talk about increasing their standard of living. And immediately all of the racial hatred stops and all the labor beaters coordinate their action to destroy a single solitary organizer that comes into that town. And if you're finally successful in organizing the town or the industry that you go in, you find the next step, harassment, delay, until such time as the employers had an opportunity to raise the wages, three, four, five cents, discharge the workers, create an unfair labor practice, and three years later, maybe you'll get an election. All of this we are living through in the year of 1961. But despite all of this, organized labor through its members, not through its leaders, in my opinion, are rapidly developing into a situation in this country to where those who are failing to act at the top will be removed where the organized labor work, you movement at the workers at the bottom will move to the top. Maybe now with the suave, polished vernacular of the experienced labor leader. But rather again, we will have those who understand what it is to have calluses and blisters on their hands. Who will understand what it is not to be able to go home on Friday nights and meet the bills after working all week long be willing to cast aside their desire for a seat on the U.N., be able to cast aside their desire to be an ambassador, and recognize the fact that they are paid out of the sweat, blood, and toil of the workers of America, and work the hours that we used to work. Traveling across this country the last 12 months, where I've been in constant negotiations since last September, I am happy to report to this convention for the first time in 61 years of the history of this international union. We have established a uniform expiration date 
We have established a minimum wage scale across the United States and all of the states and cities that we have organized of highway, city, cottage, and dock workers. <laughs> yes, without one single loss of a man hour, by careful planning, by understanding the industry, by being able to exert the pressure through our councils, we have been able to accomplish what no other labor union in this country have been. A single solitary day when all of our contracts will expire at one time. When we complete it, And when we completed our negotiations in 11 western states and 150,000 men and women working in our contracts, the great liberal from Arkansas, McClellan, immediately introduced the bill and said, the employers never had a chance when they sit down to the table because the Teamsters have a monopoly. Now I say to you, if he would have had a strike, he would have introduced the bill and said, you cannot tie up transportation. So whether you have a strike, don't have a strike, those who would destroy and disunite organized labor have the power to introduce bills. A bill which can affect this very convention. A bill which states specifically that no one transportation union can support another transportation union. A bill that specifically states you cannot have a coordinated transportation strike because a local union here in New York having a truck terminal and the same company having a truck terminal in Philadelphia cannot simultaneously go on strike. But the Philadelphia terminal must work while the New York terminal is on strike and break each other's picket line. Can you imagine that? This is the law that he introduced. A law controlling the human beings of America under a monopoly system as though it was a question of stone, steel, Many of our labor leaders clapped their hands in glee and had a cocktail or an extra martini when the law was passed, the so-called anti-teamster land and Griffin law, without realizing that the very same law passed would eventually involve and destroy all unions of America. Yes, we pleaded with organized labor to come to Washington with the United Front, walk through the halls of Congress arm in arm, Tell the senators, tell the congressmen we would not stand for any such laws. What do we find? Skillful, glib talking lawyers, skillful, glib PR men, chanting and roaring that they're against racketeering, chanting and roaring that they're clean and honest, without ever even taking time to read the bill to understand that the Landrum Griffin Law created 11 new criminal statutes in the United States against organized labor, not your employers. Yes, they fail to understand that Title VII, for the first time in the history of the United States, created not by contract, not by law, but by administrative ruling, an absolute requirement Transportation goes through picket lines and the union men be required to destroy each other's organization. Now they're waking up. Now they're realizing that they were the victims, not the Teamsters unions, because we can live or live without the law, because fortunately our men are strong, militant, willing to fight, and will not surrender nor will they lay down the battle. to you, Mike Will, that if all of organized labor in America were of the type that the Teamsters unions, long-distance drivers, city drivers particularly, who live in constant war with those who try to take them off of the road, those who would police them unfairly, who recognize and understand the need to be militant and strong in combined force, will never, never as the employer found in Denver, Colorado, as he found in Portland, Oregon, 
as he found in Billings, Montana, as he found in Salt Lake City, as he found in Little Rock, Arkansas, no matter the propaganda, no matter the sweet letters to his home, no matter the threats, the intimidation, when it came to a question of voting for strike, without hesitation and with heads high in each every single contract, they walked in and voted a hundred percent necessary, hit the bricks, knowing full well their responsibility that they were accepting in that vote because they have received today the highest single wage of any worker in America. Out of their fight. What must we do about this? What can we do about it? A very simple solution, a very simple problem. Call a convention. Sit down and analyze what has happened since 1932. What has happened since the passage of the Wagner Labor Law. And then chart a course. Find out how we, organized labor of America, can combat those congressmen and senators who believe that they have a right to run our unions, not the members by simply creating unity of a Harry Bridges, of a Mine Mill and Smeller workers, of all of the unions that were kicked out of the air of LCIO, including the Teamsters, for this single solitary reason, no other reason. Monday yes. morning, you will have headlines all over the United States. Hoffer is being investigated in a red probe. Well, I say to you, newspaper men, to McClellan, to Eastland, and all the fakers, there isn't a single one of them been fighting communism as long as Hoffa has, and I don't compromise to nobody in my position. Because we, I recognize when I became president of this international union that Dave Beck, having his forever-ending feud with Harry Bridges, had sapped the strength of both of our unions, had allowed the employer to continue non-union with substandard wages, and sitting down quietly in a hotel, working out an understanding of jurisdiction, working out a coordinated pact to where we would no longer spend our strength and our money against each other, but rather closely coordinate our activities out of that, the very first contract negotiated of coordinated activities, the greatest increase was ever granted to workers on the West Coast of the warehouse industry was given without a single loss of an hour's work. What? Single one. Because you're leaders. To go out and talk about three things in America. One. What are they going to do with unemployment? And that's first and foremost, not the atomic bomb, unemployment. Two, what are they going to do about the aged? When 65 years old is too late to enjoy life. And three, what are we going to do about our own miserable mistakes of having a divided labor organization in America? And if we have a united labor movement, are we going to have individuals who are taking care of themselves?